Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so my name is Ditai. Um, I'm an engineer from Google Tel Aviv. And I'm going to talk about how to implement your own uh, data source for the Google Visualization API. Um, I'm going to start with some introduction about the API itself in general. And then I'm going to focus on data source, the, the concept of data source, and, and what it means to be a, to be a data source of, the, of this API. Then I'm going to talk more about the open source library, the Java library that we just announced. And, and later on, uh, we'll have uh, Jesse Lawrence from Salesforce that will talk about their implementation of data source and Q&A in the end. So I'll start with a few words about the Google Visualization API. I know that some of you know it, and, and some of you were in uh, yesterday's uh, session too. But I, I just want to make sure that everybody knows what I'm talking about. Um, so this API is a tool that, that is used to visualize structured data over the web. Um, in general, it's a, a library of many visualization from different implementation, flash-based or image-based or JavaScript-based. Uh, but all of them share the same, the same API. So you load them on the same way, and, uh, and you interact with them on the same way. It's all uh, JavaScript-based API. You don't care about the implementation of the actual code. And, and it's, it's true for all of them. They're the same, the same way to, config, to configure them, to interact with them, um, and to manage events if there are events. Um, and one thing that is more important to this uh, session is that they share the same data table model. So no, no matter, again, what, if it's a pie chart in JavaScript or the motion chart in Flash, they share the same class that represents the data. And this class is called data table. Um, you load it from the, uh, when you load the, the JavaScript API, the, the, the library. And it's, it's, it's a very simple class. It's, it has rows and columns. Each column has a type that can be string, number, date, date, time, and, and so on. Um, a predefined set of, ty of, of uh, types. And each column has a type, so all of the cells from this, type, from this column uh, share the same type. Uh, you may have as many rows as you want. Um, usually it will not be uh, above a few thousand because then uh, the browser will just uh, fail to, you know, to visualize it uh, and, and to create the visualization well. Um, so le let's see just uh, a few examples. Um, so th there is a gallery in our documentation of, of all of the charts. Uh, this is a very simple example of, uh, this is the example page of the, of the bar chart. You can, uh, this is a, sorry, this is a flash based, uh, sorry, JavaScript based, so you can interact with it and, uh, and, and get events when the user interacts and so on. The code is very simple to, to create it. Uh, most of the code, this is the code that you see, that all of the HTML page that you need to have in order to see this, um, uh, this chart. Mainly what you see here is the, most of the lines in the middle is the creation of the data table and populating it with data. Um, the first row that you see is loading the, the JS API loader, the JavaScript loader um, of Google. Uh, then we call the Google load function to load the, the libraries, the, the, the library of the visualization and the, the specific packages charts that you want. Um, and then, again, we create a data table. We populate it with data, in this case, locally, just with JavaScript calls, uh, functions. And then we create the chart and draw it with this data table. And that's it. Uh, another example that I want to show is, is this one, which, in which I have a Google that takes the data from, uh, from some remote data source. And I'll explain, of course, later what it means. Uh, still, it's, it's it, one, uh, one chart that you might know from Google Finance. Uh, it's uh, annotated timeline, we call it. It's, it's time-based, the x, the x uh, axis, and the y is uh, you, you may have as many data series that you want uh, with annotations. And the last example here is this one. This is the motion chart um, in which you can see bubbles moving with uh, different x and y and size and colors. Uh, and with a time uh, timeline, so it has like five dimensions. Uh, in this case, what, what you can see is that all of the data is taken from the Google spreadsheet behind it. So it has many columns, and you can, you can set which columns means what. Uh, I can change the, um, I don't know, the color to be 
not the region, but something else, and you see that it changes on the slide, I can change it to be a um, bar chart instead of, of uh, bubbles and so on. But what I wanted to show is that I can take this one and add it, sorry, add it to iGoogle. And then in addition to the uh, time series that you just saw, I have now this motion chart that hopefully will be loaded in a second. And you see it's just the same configuration that I just set. I have it here. And the nice thing about it is that, as you can see here, I can edit the settings. And the first setting is data source URL. And now it's taking the, the, the data from the spreadsheet that we just saw. So if I change the spreadsheet data, it will, take a, it will affect this one too. So you can create data, so, um, you can create dashboards of users that, taking, that are built from charts from many other data, many different data sources, and each one of them is, is a live data. So it's not hard coded in a page. It's something that gets uh, live data from Google spreadsheets or what I want to show now uh, in this session is that you can actually build your own data source. So the data can be taken from your organization, the organizational data, um, including all of the nice features that there are in a, in a data source. <clears throat> so Again, you can create a data table locally, as we saw in the, in the example, by just creating in JavaScript a data table object and then add columns and rows and set the values. Uh, alternatively, you can use a JSON notation, which is much faster in the browser, but it's a bit harder to, you know, to implement, to write, to generate this code. Uh, but the, the effect is just the same. And in addition, you can use a remote data source. Um, then, then you get all of the good stuff that uh, is written here. You don't have to hard code the data in your page, but it's taken every time from a different place or from the, the live data that are in the data source. Um, you got a query language um, that will explain, I will explain later and show. Um, but, but in general, it means that you don't have to create any uh, variant of the data. Instead, you create a si single data table on, on the server side, and, and the data source implements the, the query language. So the user, you can just type in uh, another parameter to the URL, and, and specify the queries that you want to, uh, to do on the manipulation, the data manipulation that you want to do on it, select some certain columns or um, maybe sort the data or group it or whatever you want. Uh, auto refresh is another feature of the queries that you can set the query with auto refresh for any, any time, any number of seconds that you want. And then after this number of seconds, the JavaScript automatically send another request to the, to the data source to, to see if there is any change in the data, and if there is, it's reflected automatically in the chart. Uh, it's using the JSON constructor that we just saw, so, so it's, uh, it's much faster than using the uh, JavaScript notation of functions. And the last thing is that it's a, a public protocol, which means that you can just read it in the documentation. It's, it's well documented, and uh, um, it's, you can just know how to implement it. It's, it's not that complicated, even if you want to do it on your own. Uh, in order to send a query to the data source, so from gadget it's, it's very simple because the gadgets are already pre-built pre uh, to deal with it, so all you have to do in the gadget is to write the, the URL. But if you want to do it in JavaScript, it's not much more than this. You just create a query object, uh, pass the URL, optionally send the, the, the query language uh, phrase, and then send it with a callback, and when the response gets back from the, from the server, you just take the response, take the data table from it, and, and work with it. Um, the, the additionally, you can also check if there were any errors and, and uh, react to them. So let's talk about data source. <clears throat> so first of all, as I said, there is a public documentation uh, of, of the format and, and the format of the response and, and, the re and the request of this protocol. So it's, it's documented exactly um, all of the fields and the, deta and the details that may, or, or may be or must be in the request. Uh, and, and of course, of the, all of the things that there, are in, there should be in the response. Uh, the, it, it, already, it, um, it contains information about errors that may be so. So there is a way to pass errors, for example, access denied or any other error from the client to the, ser from the server to the client. Um, so it's not that you, the client don't get any response. 
uh, but you can pass errors and they are, uh, th most of the visualization know how to show them uh, very nicely so the user can understand that something went wrong. Mm, and another thing to, to say is that there is the new version with some improvements. Uh, I, I'm going to cover some of them. It's all documented uh, uh, in our site. Uh, there, is some additions to, there are some additions to the query language. So now it supports some uh, calculated columns and, uh, and uh, Scala functions. So if you have a field from uh, type date, you can, you can ask to get only the year part of this date and so on, which is very, very nice you know, in, if you want to do some uh, aggregations. And in the Java library that I'm going to cover later, uh, it's all fully implemented. So if you t use this library, you get the, f uh, the full query language in your data source without need to write a single, code, a single line of code that deals with it. A few words about security, because uh, just to make sure that it's clear. Uh, wh when you use a data source, it means that from the visualization, uh, a request is sent to bring the data. It's not included in the page itself, as we said. And this means that um, as on the same way that you send the request to, the, to get this data, maybe someone else might try uh, to send a request to this data. Uh, until now, we used a technique called script injection. Uh, because the, the advantage of this is that you can send requests uh, cross domain. Means that if you, get the, your, if you have your data on Google Spreadsheets, or maybe if you have your data on a one site but you want to show it on, in your blog, or if you have any public data that you want everybody to be, access, uh, to be able to, to read, so uh, we, we had to use this technique. But th the bad side is that um, it's a bit easier uh, to get uh, for, for, for people that you don't want to get this data, uh, maybe to get it. It's not easy, but it's, it's possible in some ways. Uh, now we change to use, in most of the cases, and as a default, a uh, method called XHR. So the requests are limited by default to your domain. Um, by, by, making, by authenticating the user and making sure that you know, he has the cookies that he's, uh, he needs to have, uh, you, you can be sure that the request came from the same domain that the data source is. And since uh, this, this is the common use, use case, that, so, so this is the default. And we also didn't want people to have, like, you know, mistakenly to open their data source to other people. So if you want to change it and you want other uh, domains to be able to, to get this data, it's very simple to change. I'll show it later on how you do it on the server side. But just know that the, this is the, the default is that it's only for the same domain uh, and you can open it. There are some other alternatives to, to change, to send the request in. Uh, one called make request to enable, uh, um, uh, it's something specific for gadget, you can read about it more. And if you don't specify any, anyone, any option, then it's, it's, uh, it's some, we, we apply some heuristics and, and if we see that you send a request to the same domain of your, of your web page, uh, then we use XHR, if not, we use script injection. So the query language is a bit similar to uh, SQL. You have uh, selection and, and row order, ordering and uh, grouping and even pivoting that is not possible in SQL. We don't have all of the capabilities of SQL, but uh, it's a very nice set. And, and if you have any data table that you want to present in so many uh, different visualization, you can use it. Uh, and it's very easy, very easy to use in the, uh, in the implementation of the Java, uh, Java library. Of course, in addition to this, you might have some specific uh, URL parameters. So in this Google Spreadsheet example, you see that you specify the key of the spreadsheet from which you want to read. But on top of this, you can add a TQ parameter for the query language and say, OK, this is a spreadsheet. It has, I don't know, 10 columns. But I want to read only the first and the second column because I want a pie chart that takes only two column, columns. <clears throat> so l let's, let's have a look on, the, on this uh, Java library. As a concept, this is an open source library. Uh, so you can get the code, you can modify it for your needs and do whatever you want. Uh, it has, again, as I said, full com uh, complete support for the query language. It, 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 has, it contains some, uh, some examples. So if you just load it and within, say, an hour, you can just read through the documentation of the getting started and then you have uh, working Tomcat with all of the configurations that you need. 
and you see running examples and it's very good to start with this you know now you can go and create your own examples or your own use cases that are not that simple maybe um, but still you have something to start with and you see really real visualization uh, as, as they're going to show later on today uh, there, is, there are utilities for CSV and, and MySQL. So in, in, most, in many cases, people have CSV files or MySQL data, uh, tables, and they want to use this table to visualize this data. But today, there is no way to do it. Okay, you have a CSV file in your, on your computer or in your, on your website. There is no way to use it to visualize this data. Uh, what this library provides is some classes that you can, with very small number of code lines, uh, just specify the URL of, this, uh, of these files or the location of these files, and we take it from there. We take it, we, we access these files, we, we change, we transform them into the JSON format the, of, the, of the response of this protocol. Uh, in the middle, we take the query that the user provided and apply on, on top of this data table, and, and all that you have to do is to specify the exact uh, the location of the file. I'm going to show an example of this. We have the same for SQL. Uh, as I said, by default, we use restricted same domain mode, but you can change it in, the, in a single line of code. You get the source code and you get jars. So if you just want to use it as is and you don't want to start uh, looking at the code or change it, you just take the jars, you put them on Tomcat, as I'm going to show now, and there you go. And again, it's well documented, and there, there is a user group. If you have any questions, comments, you can use it. So let's have a quick demo. So first of all, the documentation, in a general documentation of the, of the API, there is a section describing this new library. Um, and, and if you just go through the getting started, you'll see a very detailed explanation of how to install Tomcat, how to configure it, to you to have this, uh, to, to install off all of the things that you need, and, and you are set. Specifically, what I did here, I just downloaded the, uh, the jar files, and the, the, all of the configuration that is needed is to take all of the dependencies in the, the jar files, put them in the web inf directory of Tomcat, as you can see here. Uh, in addition, I took the web XML file that is the, the file that tells Tomcat where, to, uh, where the application exists, and added this, this uh, mapping for, for these servlets. So I have something called simple example here, and another one on the, on the bottom called CSV. I'm going to show both of them. Simple example is something that just creates uh, a static table, and CSV is something that takes the table from a CSV file. So let's start with the simple example. This is all the code that is here in this servlet to create uh, the response. And, and, and I'll show in a, in a minute all of, the, um, uh, all of the things that you can do with this response. It's not just a simple table as it looks. So what I do here, I implemented, uh, I have a servlet called simple example servlet. I implemented, I extended, sorry, uh, data source servlet. And it means that I only need to implement a single, a single method called generate data table. This method gets a query object, which is the TQ parameter that the user uh, may, may have uh, added to the URL with select some certain columns and so on, and the request. You might want to use the request to, you know, to know what, is the, what the other parameters the user specified or to get cookies to authenticate the user and so on. And the query, for, for the moment, let's assume that you can just ignore it. Later on, I'll show what you can do with it. But you don't have to do anything in order to have the query language working for you. Uh, so here in this example, I just build the data table object, add some uh, four columns of a name, a link, and, po and a population, and a vegetarian of, of a, a Boolean field of some animals. And then I add columns uh, for each one of these animals. And that's it. You can see that down here that I, I set the restricted mode to false, but it's just for this example. Uh, again, normally, if you don't do this, uh, then it will be true. So let's see the result of this very nice example. It looks like this. <laughs> so it's not very um, useful, at least when you want to debug your code and, and check it and make sure that you understand what's going on. 
although this is the, the, the right JSON format that, of the response. So let's see what you get for free here. The first thing is you can change the renderer, what we call, um, to HTML. So we know not only to create a JSON format out of this data table, but we know also to create a very simple data uh, table, HTML table. So when you're on the development cycle, you don't have to try to understand what went wrong. If you try to visualize it and something doesn't work, you can just uh, change the TQX parameter. Again, it's all documented, so you don't have to remember it. But you change the output format to HTML, and then you can see the table and, and find out what's going on. This is one thing. Another renderer that there is, uh, it's already written and supported, is CSV. So you might want to have a link just below the chart saying, OK, I want this data to be, I want the user to be able to download this data on CSV format. So you can just, just below the, the, uh, the chart that, that displays this data, you can have another link saying, download this data and say, have the same link of, of uh, URL, the same URL, but without CSV. And then when you click on it, when the user clicks on it, um, they get this save file option or whatever they want to do with it. In addition, let's change it back to HTML. And let's specify that we don't want the whole table. We, ju we, want, uh, we want only the first column. So there you go. TQ equals select name and you get the name. I can also order them by, by whatever field they want, or to filter these that, you know, their um, um, size equals something or whatever. Uh, and all of this, again, I just go back to the, to the code. So maybe, maybe one, more, one more thing to explain about the code structure. So there is an example here, and there is the library itself. The code I just I show now is from the example. So it, it just uses all of the code of the library as is. It doesn't change it. It doesn't do anything. So as you see, there is, it's just a small example um, creating a data table, static data table, and you get all of these renders and all of these uh, uh, query language for free without doing to need, need to do anything. So now let's move on to um, a bit more interesting example, which is uh, this one. Uh, taking, using a CSV file, and, and building the table on top of it. So what we see here is also the same, the same kind of servlet. Um, implement, I extend data source servlet, and I need to implement general, generate table function, as you see here. Uh, what I do here, I read a single parameter called URL, which is the URL, in this case, of, the, uh, of a CSV file. And I take this CSV file, and, uh, and what I'm doing with it is I, I want to to make a data table out of it. So let's see how simple it is. I just create a, I just create a reader, a Java, Java reader object, um, and giving, giving this URL so I can work with it. This is something that is general Java procedure. Uh, then I do this thing, which is interesting. It's an optional step, but what I'm doing here is I, I get the, the user, the locale of the user. Why it's important? Because in many times, as you know, in CSV files, you have dates, for example, and dates are written in CSV files in, in different formats, depending on, the loca on your locale or the, user or the, the owner of the file. Uh, so what I'm doing here is just I, I give this locale as a parameter to the, next, to the, to the parsing of the CSV file. Um, you don't have to do it. If you don't do it, we take some default locale, uh, but it's quite useful. And the last thing I do is I call a CSV data source helper uh, read command, read uh, method. I, I tell, OK, this is the reader. And it does everything that it needs to do, including passing the, uh, passing the file, creating the, uh, the JSON format. In the middle, it takes the query if the user specified any and, and uh, apply it on this data table. And there you go. There is a data table, and, and everything is done. So let's see this example in live. Um, oh, just this is. I'm going back to the to the example I showed before. So this this uh, I, I just showed you here that okay there is a table, but let's see how it's used. So this is another just a simple HTML page. 
let's say hello data source and show a chart. Uh, this chart is actually a table, a vi table visualization, not to be uh, mixed with the uh, data table that we just saw. It's a very rich table actually. You can, the user can select uh, rows and, and, and sort them and get select event when, when, something, when the user interacts with it. You can customize it very well. And it's a very nice tool. Um, I want to show you the, the, the source of this page. So you can see here that I, in the middle, I just send a query, uh, send a query um, to the remote data source called simple table. Let's do this so you can read it. So I send here a request to simple table. Uh, this is the servlet that we, we saw before on the other page. And I get the query. Sorry for that. I send the query, and when the response back, uh, coming back, I just get the data from the response and, and process it as if it's a normal data table. And now I go on to the CSV file. So again, we see here the same thing. Um, the UR see the URL on the, on the top, so it's mywebapp.csv uh, slash CSV, but then I add another parameter, URL parameter, called URL in this case, which is the URL of the, um, of the CSV file. So if I go to this file, I just open a new window. You can see it's just a simple CSV file. You, you can't work with it. You can't do anything. You can visualize this data. You can process it. But with this tool now, I have this CSV file as a data source. So I can add here, um, sorry. QX out HTML, and you see the same data. This as a data table that you can work with. Um, let, let's see this. I, I go to this playground, which is a nice tool that there is um, uh, for all of the exists for all of the Google APIs. But in this case, uh, what I want to show you is that I, I take this org chart uh, and I take this data from this URL. So I just place this URL as a, uh, the your data source URL for a query. Um, I get the response, this, this, this table, and I use this table to build an organizational chart. As you can see here, the same data. It, this is the data taken from this, um, from this CSV file. And going back here, so the, the, a few last things. Um, first of all, about the query. So you saw that the query working here, uh, but, but I didn't do anything with it. So uh, in the default mode is that we assume that you don't know how to do the, the query language, uh, which is true in most cases. So what we are doing is we're taking the data, data tables that you generate on your side in, after um, that you return in the generate data table function. And on, on top of this data table, uh, we apply the, data, the query that the user specified. But in some cases, you might want to do it on your side. Uh, a good example is that, uh, let's, let's say that you have a very huge table. And, and you don't want the, the, to return to create all of it because it has, I don't know, millions of rows. And you do know how to filter them. Uh, so if you want that if the user specified, uh, I don't know, some values or some row limit, you, you do want to get this information and do it on your own, on your side. So you can do it. You can take the query and, and apply the path that you know how to apply on your side be before you return the data table to, to the library from this, table, from this method. But in this case, you have to override uh, uh, a method called uh, get capabilities. So you just, and this, this one here, the default is none. But if you know that you can, you know how to select rows, uh, select rows or select columns or any other thing, you should mention it. So we don't do the same thing on top of your data table. Uh, so this, this is one thing. And, and this, this, is the, this is the data source servlet. Uh, you see that the, the, only, the only thing that, that you have to do after you implement it is to, is to override the generate data table uh, method that is defined in the, in the data table generator uh, in interface. And 
Maybe the, the last important thing in this uh, library for, for now is this class called Data Source Helper. So it, it is, this, this class is the main API uh, that you need to use if you don't want to just implement a servlet, uh, we, as, as we saw before. Let's say that you don't use servlets. You use maybe, I don't know, any, any kind of um, uh, another framework. You use Spring or you need uh, any other thing that, that you don't work with with simple servlets. So this, this is like a lower level API. You can do everything from here, uh, and it, this is being used by the servlet we saw before. Uh, the way it's implemented, it, it has a few sets of, of uh, static methods um, that deals with servlet, as you can see here, deal with servlet or deal with uh, how to uh, create the response or how to apply the query language at the bottom here. Uh, it has everything that you need in order to work with it. So you don't really need to care about, about all of the classes in this, uh, in this uh, library. This is your main API. If you use it, and there are examples, you can see how it's used. Uh, you, can, you can work, with, if you need not to work with servlet, but with some other stuff, then this is the way that you should use it. Uh, this is the class to use. And I just close everything so you can see the method, but as you see here, they are, they are documented quite well. And Again, it's open source, so you can see the actual implementation. Uh, so this, this is very useful. Uh, I think that's about it uh, for now. Uh, I want to call Jesse Lorenz from Salesforce. Uh, they implemented their own data source, and he will explain about it now. Thank you for that. Thank you, Ritai. So my name is Jesse Lorenz, and I'm a technical evangelist from Salesforce.com, and I primarily work with independent software vendors that are looking to build and architect applications on the Force.com platform. So some of you might not be entirely familiar with Salesforce.com and the Force.com platform, so I'm going to use just I'm going to go through a little bit of uh, terminology right now, so we're all on the same page. But before I do that, I want to talk about uh, I want to tell you what I'm going to talk about today. So uh, there's really two halves of the Google Visualization API. So there's actually the visualizations themselves, the annotated timelines, the heat maps, all that good stuff. And then as Itai spent a lot of time talking about today, there's also the data sources. So back in November, Google and Salesforce.com started a partnership, and we released a set of components that allow you to embed the Google visualizations inside of your Force.com or Salesforce CRM apps. Today, I'm really excited to announce that Salesforce.com is also now a Google Visualizations data source. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more depth in a moment. But first, just to make sure everyone's on the same page with me here, Salesforce CRM is our suite of customer relationship management applications. We've got over a million users that are using it today to uh, market and sell and support their products more effectively. Now, below that, is the force.com platform and infrastructure. So force.com allows developers to go ahead and build their own applications on top of our infrastructure. So this is very similar to what Google's done with Google App Engine and allowing you to build applications on top of Google's infrastructure. That's what force.com is. It lets you build your own business applications on top of our infrastructure. So I'm going to talk about two components of force.com today. So force.com is a complete Development stack is delivered on demand as a service. And I'm going to talk about two components today. One is Visual Force. And Visual Force is what we refer to as our user interface as a service. It, it's our markup language that uh, provides you with a bunch of pre-built components that ultimately gets trans translated into HTML. And then uh, we're also going to talk about Apex, which is one portion of our logic as a service layer. And it actually allows you to write and run code on our servers on demand. It's a very Java-like language. You'll see a lot of similarities here in a moment. So enough talking. I want to show you some of the demos. Hopefully that's enough background. And the first thing that I want to show you is how we're already using the visualizations inside of Salesforce today. So here's my login. I'm going to log in to a sample uh, org for Salesforce. And what you can see is that Salesforce actually has its own analytics engine. We allow you to do reporting and to create your own visualizations just by pointing and clicking. 
We've got gauges, pie charts, you know, pretty much all the standard visualizations. But one of the really exciting things is that with our new release coming out in June, in just, just a few weeks from now, you can actually embed Visual Force pages inside of your dashboards as well. And this is an example of the annotated timeline component inside of a Visual Force page displayed on your dashboard. And as you can, can see here, we've got two different salespeople, and you can see that they have fairly widely divergent performance. And so if we want to, we can zoom in, we can take a look and, and uh, start playing with the annotated timeline just like you're used to using it. And so this makes our dashboards even more interactive. We think it's really great uh, to have Google visualizations inside of Salesforce. So we did the demo. And also, I, I'm really excited. This, this opens up brand new use cases to the Force.com development community. I'm really excited to announce that Force.com is now a Google Visualization data source. So what I'm going to focus on today is unauthenticated access to your Force.com or your Salesforce CRM data. So I think this is really neat because I think what we've seen recently is that there's really a move towards greater transparency in our society. So I think you might have seen that Google released uh, the ability to go in and drill into uh, like housing data, housing sales price data, and unemployment data across the nation. And so you can start going in and looking at that. And recently, data.gov was just released as well, which exposes a whole bunch more census data. And so people are, are, are able to go in, and look at that data, visualize it, and understand it more. And this is another step towards that transparency. And now companies can actually go out and start exposing their internal data. And when we thought about this, we thought, boy, there's just a whole bunch of use cases that are, are really interesting here. So if you're in marketing and you're putting on a conference like Google I.O., you might want to put out a heat map that shows where all your different users are coming from so that they can uh, figure out if they're going to be able to make connections from their home state or their home country. You know, if you're in sales, you might want to expose your product list. You might want to expose your most popular products, just like Amazon does, right? They list the top books that are, are being sold today. With uh, Force.com as a, a visualization data source, that's really easy. That's 10 lines of code. Your company can do that as well. And finally, the use case that I'm going to go through today is also being able to expose your support data. So the sample that I'm going to walk through in just a moment here is actually at a call center where you can actually start to expose your call volumes uh, proactively to your users. So let's take a look at what that might be. So I've mocked this up for the California Department of Motor Vehicles. This isn't real. This is, you know, this is a demo. Um, they're not doing this today. But you can see that here's the page, right? So if I wanted to call the DMV, you could use that number. You could do that right now if you're really bored. But the call volume for today can be displayed down at the bottom. And this is really interesting, right, for two reasons. Because if I'm calling the DMV, I can take a look and say, all right, it looks like it might be a bad time to call a DMV. I don't really want to sit on the phone. I'm probably just going to call tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I'll get right in. I'll talk to someone. I'll be done. It's also an advantage because if people start doing that, then the utilization of your call center should smooth out, right? So I think this is a really powerful uh, example of your data source, of using uh, your internal Salesforce CRM or force.com data and exposing it to the public. And so I want to show you how easy that is. And to do that, we can look at the page source for this page. I've, I've simplified it a little bit here so that we can all understand it. But you know, up at the top, we've got some really basic styling. And the interesting parts are really this, this JavaScript here, right? So we're going to load the, the JavaScript API for the visualizations. And then we're also going to, uh, what Itai showed before, we're also going to create this query object. And again, you know, here's the URL to our data source. And this is public. You could go to this right now. I'd encourage you not to, since it's kind of a small developer instance. But uh, we can actually we can take this data source right here. I'll copy that E as well. And we can see the data that's being returned by this endpoint. And so there it is. So you know, we didn't have to do anything in order to generate this. This is all being generated for us. And if we want to see what that looks like visually, you know, we can go over to iGoogle here. And we can, uh, we can drag our force.com data source into a gadget on iGoogle. So paste the URL there, and we'll hit Save. 
And you can see all the different fields that are available to us at this endpoint. But one of the things that we've done is we've actually, uh, we've actually added a query, or we've implemented uh, parts of the query language here so that you can start filtering and you can specify the columns that you want to return, you can specify order buys and limits and things like that. And so to give you an example of that, you know, we'll add that TQ parameter that Itai mentioned before. And we'll select uh, the hour and the number of calls. Oops. Oh, looks like I've got an error there. So that was really simple. Uh, so it, that was really simple to do, to wire that up, that visualization. But let me show you the code that we had to write. And I'm going to go in. This is the, the force.com IDE. This is the integrated development environment for force.com applications. And I'm going to go to that page, my endpoint there, call volume. And you can see there's not a lot on this page. You know, this is Visual Force here. It might be unfamiliar, but we can understand it. So the, the important thing here is that there's a controller behind this page that follows the model view controller architecture. There's a controller called call volume uh, data source controller. And uh, through this syntax, we're calling a method called get response. And so if we take a look at that controller that's behind our Visual Force page, we can look at the methods that we had to implement in order to expose this data source. So there's two methods here. There's get table name. So I'm querying the call volume table. And then I've also exposed a list of default columns. And I've got five here, the ID of the record, the name of the record, date, hour, and the number of calls. So that's pretty much all you have to do from a code perspective to expose a data source, a force.com, as a data source to Google visualizations. Uh, one of the things that I haven't shown here is that there's also some security that you're going to need to set up, of course. You probably don't want to go and expose all of your accounts and contacts and leads to the public internet. And so you can do that. You can prevent that from happening by just going in and uh, setting the security settings using our default implementation, our tried and true, tested, decade old uh, security methodology. And so uh, none of what you see here is, is actually security code. You don't have to worry about that at all. So. Uh, I'm very excited about this. I'm very excited about the fact that with just about 10 lines of code, you can start making your force.com applications into data sources as well for Google visualizations. And uh, if you'd like to learn more, I would encourage you to go to developerforce.com. And I think we're ready for questions. Is that right, Itai? So. Yeah, that's about it. Um, so again, if you need any more information, so there is detailed, detailed documentation and many examples, um, user group and everything uh, on our site, just Google for Google visualization. Um, I hope you'll find it useful. Thank you. And if you have any questions. Yeah, and, and I think if you do have questions, it'd be great if you could use the microphone for the recording. So with the uh, querying over the data sources, are there, are there where clauses in that query syntax? And yeah. if it's implemented over a CSV file, say through the Java library, are indexes built for very large files? And where are those indexes stored? So no, th there is no indexing for CSV files at the moment. Uh, not, not in the implementation that there is in the library. Uh, again, it's open source, so it's something that can be added later or by your own, by, but, but there is no indexing. Um, but yes, there is where uh, close. There is uh, you can filter rows with where, and there is ordering, order by group by pivot, and column selection, calculated columns, and so on. Okay, so it'd be pretty straightforward. There's a method that you could override that does probably a linear search right now, but you could have it use an index instead. So th the index that you you'd like to use, I guess, is when you build the data table from the. Uh, uh, from, from the CSV, CSV file, but, but now it's not implemented with index. No. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Instead of doing a um, general SQL query, could you uh, call a stall procedure? Uh, no, so, so the, the current implementation for MySQL means that you have to specify the tables that you want to use. 
the, the, the good way to, to create kind of, to use thought procedure, I believe, is to create a dynamic view on the SQL side. Um, you know, you can define a view with some, sub, some um, predefined selection, and then you can uh, refer to it as a table. So that would be it. I have two questions. Um, first one, just a general historical question about the protocol. Um, I was investigating, and I know that there's something called um, the DAP protocol and also something called Open DAP, which is used in um, applications for like weather data and also been applied to s astronomy data and things like that. And I'm wondering if there's been some, you're shaking your head no, so you pr probably didn't invest, or maybe you're not familiar with that, but I'm wondering if there's something that was kind of a predecessor, or it was used as a um, inspiration for the protocol that's used, just to put it into context for what. No, so what's, I'm, okay, all right. I'm so, not sort of ge there. generated fresh from the ground up, then. Sorry. Okay. Then the second question is, um, if there's a, if we have a lot of data that um, is not stored in the CSV format, so I'm just a custom binary format, um, what would be the the technique that we could use to to make it available for visualization? Um, so, so as we saw before, you can just implement the generated data table, and and you, you'll have to to build your own code. But the nice thing is, all, all you have to do is to to generate a code that takes this internal format that you know, and create a data table object. All right. So yeah. you, you can take a look at the CSV implementation, which is by the way using um, some some external code called the uh, Open CSV. So it's an open source. Uh, but but but. Generally speaking, it's, it's quite simple. All you have, if, if you already have the data and you know how to modulate it to be a two-dimensional uh, table, then you're set. Build the actual Java coding that needs to build a, a data table and add rows and columns is very simple. Right. Okay. Hi. Um, I just had a quick question about the query language. Um, if I have a really dumb data source that I create myself that's just producing like the JSON format for the columns and the rows with the data in it. Can I use the query language on that? Is that, is that an understanding correct? That I can actually query against um, a data source that doesn't actually implement any of the query language? So, so this is a, a data source that you implemented? Yes. Yeah. So it will not work as, as, as is. You'll have, to, you'll have to implement the, data ta the, the query language. Um, so Either, either you can implement it, look at the spec and implement it, or, uh, or you may uh, just take the, use, if, if it's Java-based, you may want to consider to use this Java library and uh, to re-implement your data source. Okay, so when you were saying that the query language doesn't expect it, well, I think I was reading with it, it says that the query language doesn't expect the data source to implement the full, like the full feature set of the query language, it just means that you can no, just so pick and choose which parts you want to use. W we refer to the data so to the query language as a, a optional, Part of the spec of the of the protocol, because we know it's it's um, it's quite hard to implement it. We did it, <laughs> so parsing it and implementing it is 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 not that easy. So it, it, you don't have to do it to, to be a to be a data source. And in many cases, if you want to be the data source of your own site, so there is no really need real need to do it. You can use your external parameters and w whatever you know to return, you just return it. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Anyone else? Uh, I have a question about uh, MySQL in particular. Um, so I'm curious about with the query language, are you actually parsing the query that's coming in or with MySQL, are you just passing that through to MySQL? I'm thinking so, about this just because I have implemented something which is similar. I like your architecture much better. So if I'm looking at porting what would be gobs of SQL that I've already got, am I going to have to make it so that it's compatible, the SQL is compatible with your SQL? Yeah, okay, this is a good question. So what we are doing, we actually pass the data because um, we, we just want to make sure that there is no error and stuff like this, and so we pass it, but we don't implement it. What we are doing, we pass this, this query um, to, to MySQL. So we pass it on the first then, and then what we are doing, we, we build a SQL query and send it uh, to the MySQL engine. Okay, so we pass it, but we don't implement it. Uh, unless there is one case that we do it on our own, uh, which is, for example, the pivot. So in, in our query language, you can specify pivot. We found it very useful. 
Um, so many times people have you know data of, of uh, quarterly data and so on, and you want to pivot it to show quarters like this. And MySQL and SQL in general uh, does not support pivot, which is a pity, but, but this is the situation. So in this case, we have to do it on our side. So we don't pass anything, or most of the cases, we don't pass anything to, the, to MySQL, but do it on our side. But any other way, if, if we see that the query is something that SQL can deal with, we pass it on to that's, SQL. That's great. I didn't realize you guys were doing that. That's really good to know. So are there any limitations in terms of, you know, uh, if you think of sort of the body of SQL that something like MySQL could handle, whether it's, you know, unions or different types of joins or really complex or verbose SQL? Yeah. So for now, joins and unions are not part of the query language. So you have to to create a you know predefined view uh, on your data source, on your database, and call it as a data table from from our side. Uh, this is one thing. But as about the size of the of the data, um, usually it doesn't make sense to pass the data that is more than a few thousand of rows uh, to to the to the browser. It will just um, take a long time to be processed and to be sent to the browser. And usually most visualizations don't know how to show uh, such, a, such amount of data. So you'd, you'd better send some kind of grouping information or filtering uh, in the query language. OK, thank you. All right. OK, thank you, everybody. Uh, any other questions? OK, so um, I don't know. You can come here maybe and um, ask later. OK, thank you.